Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents, where this evening we're doing our third segment that we've done on wolves. And my guest this evening is Peggy Callahan, who is the Executive Director of the Wildlife Science Center, located near Forest Lake, Minnesota. And uh, it's a good time to talk about wolves because, as you know, we just finished our first trapping and hunting season with wolves, which has been a, a pretty controversial issue, probably will be controversial into the future for a while because there are a lot of states that don't do this yet, of course. Um, but before we talk about our hunting and, and uh, trapping season, I'd like to just spend a few minutes with Peggy and talk about the Wildlife Center, what it does, some of the research that's going on. She's also facing a new challenge there in that where they're located is going to be moved, <clears throat> and um, that's going to be a challenge for you financially, as I understand. So maybe we can uh, get some people interested in helping you out along the way. But what, what does the Wildlife Sci uh, Science Center do, Peggy? Our primary goal is to get science education uh, to kids in a way that's that's accessible, digestible, and meets the really variety of needs of kids. So we have two licensed science teachers that write all of our programs, and we work with K through 12 and post secondary uh, students. And animals are their people have a natural affinity for animals, and so we found not just traditional students do well with our programs, but non traditional learners really enjoy it too and learn the skills of inquiry and investigation. So it's really it's been very very successful. Um, but we also do research, so the animals that are there uh, serve many roles. We do research on animals looking at questions that are oftentimes then applied to field settings. And an example of that would be we have been asked by the USDA to do a DNA test on, on carcasses after a known carnivore bit on them. And we have mountain lions, we have bobcats, we have coyotes, and we have wolves, the Minnesota natives. So we give them a carcass, let them bite on it, and then we collect the saliva over a 48-hour period to see if the sample degrades, and then we verify that DNA by taking the DNA off that animal. Because oftentimes what, ha what has happened is the USDA is called upon to identify what killed my sheep, what killed my cow. Mm -hmm. And um, although the people in Minnesota, the USDA, are very, very, very good at that, um, there sometimes are questions, especially out west. So um, this is just another tool to use and to see whether or not it's actually usable in the field. Because if you get there after 48 hours, your sample may be degraded. So that's, that's our role is to do some of the basic um, answers, questions that we can do. And where are you located near Forest Lake? Kind of, are you, is it just outside of Forest Lake? We are, <laughs> actually. It used to be Forest Lake proper, but we're, our, our little township made itself into a city. So we're about six miles west of Forest Lake proper. And how, how big of an area do you have? We have about nine acres right now that we are leasing from the state of Minnesota. The state has other plans for the land that we're on, and so they've given us a five-year timeline, which um, is, is difficult, but I think uh, we own the property that we want to move to, and we have a very good builder and a concept. We just need uh, some support to get there. So and how a, many acres will be the new We have 165 acres oh, wow. at our new site, so it's a beautiful piece of land. It's bought and paid for. So, and it, we use it currently for a couple of different activities. We have two youth hunts, an archery hunt in the fall and a turkey hunt in the spring. And I have to add that the archery hunt goes on regardless of the presence of our captive wolves. The wild deer look in the wolf cages and, and really? just walk by. Mm -hmm. They're very well aware that our wolves are confined. And our archery kids took six deer off of our property last year. So it's, you know, it, 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 isn't, it isn't what you'd think that the wolves would prevent that activity. It, it, it goes on. So in the spring, it's a turkey hunt. So you have wolves, bobcats, did you say coyotes? Mountain, 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 mountain lions, lions, coyotes. Uh, we also have some birds of prey. So we have, a, a, and fox, we have gray fox and red fox. So we have a pretty good representative of, of Minnesota's carnivores. We'd love to get more of the small guys like the weasels and the mink and things. And, and when you get these particular animals in your center, do they pretty well stay as inhabitants then to, for their lifetime? Absolutely. The only <laughs> exception to that would be the Mexican gray wolves and red wolves that belong to the federal government and we house on behalf of the federal government. We're not paid to do that. That's part of our conservation mission. And those species, unlike the Minnesota populations, are not from recovered populations, and so they're still dependent on captive breeding to help. So we have a, a breeding pair of red wolves, for example. Puppies that are born will then be forwarded to the reintroduction in North Carolina. We have Mexican gray wolves that we house on behalf of the reintroduction as well. 
So when you do you do uh, research for I suspect more than one place. Absolutely. And so you have scientists that come and go from your. Property, yep, scientists come and go, or we conduct it on behalf of the scientists. So, okay. uh, for example, the USDA folks came out and, and demonstrated to us what, we, what they wanted us to do, and we demonstrated to them just how tricky it was going to be to hand a mountain lion a carcass and then get it back after they drooled on it. So oh, that, sure. was, that was fun. Um, so, yes, we, we do both. We also have graduate students as clients, so there are lots of folks that we work with. And when did this actually start, and how did it get funded when it was first started? Well, this was it was started in 76 as a federal project, and so I joined the team in 1985. I'm a Carleton grad, a biology major, and I worked for five years for the feds, and uh, I loved it. It was really exciting, but the facility was in pretty bad shape. Um, so in 1990, when the federal funding went away, no one was interested in picking up the pieces, and so, but I was, and I thought, I'm near the Twin Cities, I want to continue this, and education was something that we didn't do under the feds, I really wanted to do as a private entity, and thought that my, my message was different than a lot of other folks. I'm a hunter, I'm an outdoors person, I thought I could bring a different, a different message to the table, so I quit graduate school, which, don't quit graduate school, um, and started a nonprofit, and that was in 1991. So we have, we have evolved since then, and, and our education programs are alive and well. So your funding for how you operate now comes from your own, whatever All you private, guys do. Exactly, you, you, and, and private foundations and, and donors and things like that. So we're completely dependent on the public. We get no state or federal funding at all. So. And the, when you're moving to your new facility, how far away will that be? It's just the next exit up, so oh, okay. it's not very so far not at all. Right, so far. our clientele wouldn't, wouldn't have so much so part of your challenge, I guess, would be the fencing it in. Yeah, of some um, sort, right. And then buildings. Yeah, and the enclosures for the animals are certainly going to be challenging. We're not going to fence all 165. We're going to continue the hunts. We're going to continue the the activities. In fact, we're we're all, we have six cabins planned on the area so that people can come and stay in in basic cabins and and enjoy listening to wolves. We have a wonderful warbler migration that goes through in the spring and the fall. So there's a lot of different outdoor activities that we're considering using in this space because it's attached to some beautiful marshland, and, and so it's a neat, neat opportunity for us. Now, what would your connection be to the uh, Wolf Center in Ely? Well, they have some of our wolves, um, and they're, you know, they're good friends of ours, and we have certainly partnered on some conferences, and we do consult for them. So they're, we've known those folks for a long time. They're good friends. So. And uh, how many wolves do you actually have in your facility? We have 58 wolves. Wow. So we have a, uh, we have a lot of wolves. That must so. be one of the larger research facilities for wolves in the country, isn't I it? I suspect it is. I suspect and it is. And those are all Canis lupus? The, the or Canis part. rufus um, so for the red wolves. So a couple different. Right. So we have, and yep. Gray. And we have subspecies from three different regions. For, for the, for the, we have Mexican grays, which is a, a gray. We have the Central Great Lakes, which is the uh, nubilis, Canis lupus nubilis. That, that's the guy we have. And then we have animals from the western part of the country in western Canada, which is occidentalis. So that, those are the great big guys. So. so when people come, are are the wolves in an area that's where they're pretty free to roam around in that, on that nine acres? Or they're in they... separate enclosures because they are one of the you know one so of the different packs. I yes, think. yes, and certainly one of the, the things we'll talk about in a few minutes is that wolves are lethal to other wolves, and that's one of those things that doesn't come up in conversation very much. So we can't mix wolves with other wolves, and even in, within their own packs, they will kill each other. So we have separate enclosures, but people get a really good opportunity to see them up close. So people can take pictures, mm -hmm. come in and take photos mm -hmm. of them? Yep. And uh, what would be your oldest aged wolf be probably there? Well, right now, I think we have a couple of 15-year-olds. We had a wolf that was brought to us for eating sled dogs in northern Minnesota, and she lived to be 21. Wow. So, yeah, I'm thinking maybe sled dog meat is the fountain of youth. I'm not sure, but she lived for an <laughs> awfully long time. Well, they're not so. chihuahuas. We know no, that. exactly, exactly. So that's no mean feat. <laughs> so when you, um, how long do you have before you have to make this move to your new facility? We have five years. So, we have five years. So. so how much money do you need to raise? Well, our entire capital campaign that we're looking at is about $5 million dollars which um, we don't have to have the entire facility built in order to move, but we have to have a place to teach and we have to have a place to house our animals. So we're probably looking at at least 2.2 .2 mil to get there. So um, it, doable in some areas. I think it's doable, but it, you know, I've certainly never raised $2.2 .2 million before, so it'll be an exciting endeavor. It's not the worst thing in the world to have a gun to your head. I think you know you have to do it, you do it. So, uh, yeah. Um. You said that it, when you do make this move, you would probably be able to expand even the educational, some of the educational things that you're doing now in the smaller area. 
Absolutely. So it'll give you an opportunity to do new things. Absolutely. And the wolf research isn't going away. It seems to be oh, increasing no. all the time, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. And what? we do a, a chemical immobilization class. We partner with some very incredible biologists and a veterinarian from out west, and we teach um, how do you drug wild animals when you're studying them. And, and more and more agencies are requiring their staff to get this certification. And so our classes are packed. Classes are packed, and they actually get to go through a chemical mobilization of a wolf or a mountain lion or a bear, um, things like that, so they, they get hands-on learning. Um, when you are working with these wolves, are they still basically wild? Oh, yes. They're not tame. You don't actually... Some of them are bottle-fed, <clears throat> but what's ironic is that the bottle-fed ones are more dangerous for us than the ones that are not because really? the, the fear of humans is what keeps us alive in the woods here in Minnesota. The fearless wolves are one of the problems if wolves aren't fearful of you. So, I mean, I certainly count on wildlife being fearful of me when I go into the woods. So the wolves that are not fearful at all and have a context in which to approach um, are the ones that are, you know, in some ways you can get lulled into complacency because they're dog-like and they greet you in a dog-like fashion. But remembering that this is the ultimate grown-up canid and when they mature, they're hardwired to try to overthrow a leader of a pack. And if a leader is a two-legged homo sapien, that's easy. Hmm. That's easy job. So we are always vigilant, always careful, and have had multiple experiences where wolves challenge you. And you just don't enter that enclosure with, with that animal. So I have a couple of friends who have been trappers in Alaska, and they, they've told me that it's amazing when the wolf has been trapped, how passive they get when you walk up to them. Because apparently they've probably expanded all their energy and they're pretty afraid of people and they said they just almost lie down that's right that's right and and trappers uh, uh, John Hart one of my heroes in the USDA says this is the most fearful predator on the landscape that he deals with and he removes all kinds of different wild animals that are causing problems so and I certainly have approached other critters and traps bobcats wow um, little powder kegs and uh, even raccoons when you didn't mean to catch mm -hmm. them there all of these things, once uh, an, an incidental badger in a wolf trap, and that was a very angry creature. Uh, but the wolves are very passive. They tend to be very, very fearful. Hmm. Well, before we get into the controversy of the hunt and the trapping, could you just help us understand a little bit about the wolf pack nature? How Absolutely. they function? I, I think that's fascinating to learn how their hierarchy works and the range that they have in a, in a pack. And Just help us out a little bit to understand sure. that. The, the basic concept of a wolf pack is a, is a family, and so there are breeders, and sometimes they're called alphas, but breeders and one or two generations of their offspring, usually not too many more off, uh, generations than that. And the reason that they are social is because they're fairly inefficient predators, unlike a mountain lion that's a very efficient predator and so can kill sufficient amounts to raise young on its own. So that's a really important distinction. I think we get very trapped up in thinking that um, the wolf is a pack animal because they love each other and we impart human characteristics to this group, but they are cooperative because they need to be cooperative. And so they help raise puppies. Um, and when the puppies are adults, though, it's adult wolf and adult wolf. And so we see a lot of fall pup starvation. We see um, yearlings dispersing from packs. Actually, young have dispersed as, as early as 10 months of age. Um, and Dave Meech re uh, reports that after five years, there's none of the original pack members are there. So it's not this long-term stay-together family that we kind of have that concept and, and learn from the neighborhood zoo. It's not like that. Um, and their territory size is really based on um, they don't have a lot of tolerance for human activity in their, in their territories, and that's different than coyotes and fox. They also, it has to have enough prey density to su sustain them. And that's why we see in Minnesota these much smaller territories for a four to six animal pack that's 10 to 12 square miles is not unusual, whereas out in, in Montana it's 400 square miles because mm. the prey density is so much less. Wow. And, and how long do these av average animals live in the wild? Uh, wolves in the wild are fairly short-lived compared to other things. They are about six years as average. You know, some, some animals have made it longer, uh, some animals shorter. There are lots of mortality factors out there, including humans. We're at the top of the list, and, and uh, illegal take, unfortunately, is something that's been going on in Minnesota for a long time. We also have removal during livestock situations. We have accidents hitting them with cars. But wolf-to-wolf -wolf mortality is a very important thing to remember, too. And that's, that's right up there. Wolves, wolves are competitors with wolves, and they target one another. So, in fact, wolf packs target breeders. 
because that's the most, and, and that again was Meech and Todd Fuller looking at what went on in Superior National Forest with wolves killing wolves over 25 years. They saw that, that wolves were targeting breeders, and that makes sense. It lowers competition. Yeah, exactly. And it lowers competition, it lowers food stress, so um, it makes sense. Wow. Primary uh, prey in Minnesota? Is white-tailed deer. White-tailed yeah. deer. You know, and, and we certainly changed the face of Minnesota. There's no more woodland caribou. The bison are gone. Our elk population's insignificant. Um, they certainly will eat smaller mammals. Beaver are very uh, popular with them. They'll eat a, a raccoons. I once was tracking wolves and saw um, a wolf stumbled on a grouse that burst out of the snow, and based on the, the blood and feathers, he got it. So, mm. But they're certainly not pursuing grouse or things. It's just an, an incidental. They'll eat just about anything they can come upon, rabbits, etc. But their primary food source is a, is a large ungulate. So it's the, it's the white-tailed deer. And pretty cunning and intelligent animals, aren't they? Very bright. Very, very bright. Um, but very well adapted to their niche. And there's been some interesting research looking, comparing dogs to wolves, and dogs are far more able to read and interpret human behavior than wolves are when it comes to getting food cues. And that makes sense. Uh, dogs' entire survival is dependent on reading humans, whether they're feral mm -hmm. or pets. Mm -hmm. So wolves really can't do that. So they have a fairly plastic response to the environment. It works very well where they live, but trans, you know, transform that and transplant it, it doesn't work very well. Maybe we could set the stage for how we have gotten into the uh, hunting and, and trapping season in Minnesota. Uh, how long has it been since wolves have really been reintroduced sort of into the state? And do we really totally know our population or are those really wild guesses? I, I, and I ask that because I know the DNR has had so many positions cut from this research that they used to do, even in the deer. I know people have used to do deer studies. They're not there anymore. I mean, they're guessing. Do we have a pretty good handle on the wolf population, or is it a pretty good educated guess, do you think? I actually have a lot of confidence in, in the um, numbers that they've come up with, and they're very, uh, because they're under the gun with this species, they're very vigilant about, about this. And with any population, it's not a count, it's a survey. And so um, there, are, there are brackets, plus or minus a certain number of animals, but I think they're very good, and they get backed up by... Um, things like the USDA, the folks that, again, respond to the livestock law. So there's a lot of cooperation between agencies. So I'm very confident that they do. And wolves actually were never reintroduced into Minnesota. We never lost our population. Okay. So we had a source population from Canada. So 60, 1965 is when the bounty stopped, and we had an estimated three to 500 wolves. And they were not listed or protected fully federally for another nine years. And what's interesting is that from 65 to 74, the population really – started to recover and was around 1,000 animals when they were listed, which says to me that even, and people could still kill them, even with human-caused mortality, this is a resourceful, adaptable, fecund species, and they were recolonizing even as early as the 60s. So um, under federal protection, which was never full federal protection because by 77, uh, the feds were removing problem wolves. Um, the animal went from you know 500 animals in 65 to what we have present day, which is around 3,000. And according to the DNR and the USDA, the population's been pretty stable for the last five years or so. And I believe it. It's if you look at where they, they the range has expanded, they haven't moved into the metro area. They haven't moved into the southern part of the state where there's a lot of deer because there's an awful lot of human activity. And some of the folks like John Herb from Minnesota DNR report that there's interesting combinations of forest cover and and um, road densities, et cetera, that seem to make up a, a network of why we don't see wolves moving into these areas. So last year uh, they delisted the wolf mm -hmm. and did not make them an endangered species. How, how many states are actually hunting wolves? Uh, we have Wisconsin, Minnesota, Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, and Alaska. Alaska so is there six, 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 six right. states. So there's only one state with a recovered wolf population right now that is not hunting them, and that's Michigan. And Michigan certainly will. I think they're um, sitting back and waiting to see what happens uh, in these other states, and, and it's a wildly, intensely controversial um, undertaking. So, and, and I know your position, because you've been on our show a couple of times, that your position's been that when the populations reach a certain level, they need to be managed somewhat. And I know you wrote a, uh, an editorial in the Star Tribune this fall, and I think you took a pretty good beating from that, didn't you? I did. I haven't been called some of those names before. <laughs> and, and it was... Just a lot of people who just don't think we should be hunting them or trapping them, right? I think that's right. I think that's right. And let me back up a little bit. I don't think in Minnesota 
we have to hunt wolves. I think we can hunt wolves. Um, I think what, what has, has happened here is that we see a, a population that is twice the population that we considered needed to be for recovery, and there are interest groups that want to partake in an ancient tradition of harvesting wolves for fur, for whatever, for food, whatever people use, and we can do it in a sustainable, ethical way. And so we're offering them the chance to hunt, and that's um, something that's taken place in other states for a long time. Alaska, Canada's hunted with wolf population. And uh, Todd Fuller uh, looked at 29% human-caused mortality in a population and still having populations increasing at a rate of 3 to 4% every year. So we really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the Minnesota DNR's plan. It was very conservative. It was science-minded. It was based on, on very good information. 400 wolves out of 3,000 is nothing. It's a 13% of the population. So we know that, that we can sustain that. You know, I, I, I'm a hunter. I'm not a wolf hunter, but I mean, I am a hunter. And, and I think the thing that I found that people who are after wolves for hunting or trapping have a real respect for them. Uh, I mean, they really do. It's not, you know, you're just not out to kill an animal. I just think that they re appreciate how smart they are and how cunning and intelligent they are. And I have a family member who got a permit, and oh. he went out in one night and set a snare, and he caught the wolf in one night, <gasps> if you can believe that, wow. up at Deer River area. Wow. It was the ugliest animal I've ever seen. <laughs> I hate to say that, but it was small. It looked like a, maybe a yearling, mm -hmm. and it really had mange oh. really bad. About half of the fur was gone wow. off it, so it wouldn't have made it through the winter anyway. Right, right. But, and mange is one of the side effects of overpopulation, is it not? Uh, no, mange is not endemic. Necessary? No, oh, okay. mange is endemic. It's, is that, it's caused by tick, isn't it? It's a tiny little mite. It's mite. A very, very mite, okay. a very small mite, yes. And it's, it's communicable through touch. So that's why it's endemic in wolf populations, but whereas something like an a animal that's less uh, social, it doesn't necessarily spread through the population. So mange is, is around to stay, and warmer climates are going to make it more sustainable. So wolves can recover from mange. In oh, fact, Wisconsin DNR has had animals they've trapped one year that are essentially naked, and the next year they're fully haired. So oh, I think really? mange probably gets a foothold with an animal that's compromised, and then if the animal recovers from whatever is compromising it, they can actually recover from mange. So I think we see much less of that in domestic dogs, but domestic dogs do not have the immune system that wolves have. Interesting. So, so it sounds like the DNR is pretty happy with how their first season went, and I think they reached their numbers maybe even quicker than they thought they would. I think so. And was that because of the hunt, or was that because of the trapping? Well, actually, I think we were all surprised at how effective the hunting was as well. None of us were surprised by the trapping piece, but it really, I was, I was certainly surprised by how quickly hunters caught them. And uh, uh, in response to your point about, about folks that were hunting them, I read uh, the young man that shot the biggest wolf, the 117-pounder, that's an enormous wolf. Um, I read his report, and, or heard his report, and I, I was very impressed with it. He expressed the angst that hunters have, the joy at the at the harvest and the sadness at the at the taking. And I think if we lose that, we lose the beauty of hunting. So I was very pleased with hearing that perspective, and I'm sure it's shared by all of us that I think that it do is. That. I really do. I mm -hmm. think it is too. Mm -hmm. um, now they're going to reevaluate. Are they going to reevaluate what th this season has meant? And where is the DNR? Are they are they coming back with a similar look at the same numbers next year? Do you think? Or I think it's premature to okay. decide what they're going to do. I certainly from I think science is going to support them, but but winter makes a difference. Deer populations make a difference, so they base all of these harvests on the data that's coming in. I'm I'm waiting to see what profile of wolves are taken. Is there a profile? Um, for, I got to participate in a necropsy of a female, and she was clearly a yearling, and she had horrible lice, horrible lice. Oh, really? So yeah, so it's interesting. You know, life is tough out there. It's it's, and mm -hmm. she was very very lean. Um, so I I will be interested to see what happens. I don't believe they're done with the analysis. I know they harvested a tooth out of the wolves to get an age class for all the animals and um, looked at hides, collected reproductive organs, so looking for pregnancy scars and stuff. So they've done a really thorough job looking for these things, monitoring disease levels. So I, I'm excited to see the data that comes out. Uh, my family member, who shall remain unnamed, is also a biologist, so he did take his uh, wolf in and had all that the blood samples taken and everything. So he's waiting to see 
they're going to give him feedback oh, about terrific. the animal that he did take. That's wonderful. And That's it, 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 I'm impressed with how detailed the DNR has mm -hmm. been about this whole mm -hmm. process. I just have to say I'm kind of horrified by, I, I know why your family member's nameless. I have heard horror stories of folks that have had death threats because they have um, expressed that they're trapping and hunting wolves. Um, I believe a conservation officer took his son trapping, and it was so exciting for them to share this experience, and he had death threats. So wow. I'm, I'm disgusted. I'm disgusted. Uh, have a, having a difference of opinion is different than threatening a human life because that, of this. Really it's disgusting. Hard, it? Ugh. Is, it's, is that is that um, a regional thing, or is it a statewide thing? Is it more common towards the metro area where there's maybe more people who are anti-hunting, or, or is it all over? Well, I, there have been old public opinion surveys, and I, I, don't, I haven't seen any really good published ones lately, but the public opinion surveys show that the closer you get to the metro area, the more people love wolves, which makes sense to me. They're, the they're the mythology, that's right, mm -hmm. they're, not, they, they're not on the landscape seeing that it's, it's an animal. It has mange, it, it kills dogs, it does things. And I, I love wolves. Obviously, Ray, I've devoted my entire life to them, and I love them as a predator, not as an icon. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just missing from the conversation. This conversation hasn't been about wolves for a long time. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, so you say they're going to look at all the conditions, the weather conditions, because they do sort of have a target now, and we're down to our last minute. They have a target, and that's kind of what they're going to try to maintain, that, that uh, population. Is that kind of Actually, that's not it at all, oh, and, I, and I like that about the DNR. They're not, popular, they're not targeting a particular okay. uh, population goal. They're letting wolves live where wolves are going to live, and they respond only to the nuisance animals. So what they're saying is we can take 400 wolves, and we may not even see a, a dip at all. We may not even see, because of reproduction, we may lower reproductive stress, or we may, wolves that die by our hand aren't going to die by another way. So it's compensatory mortality. So we might, the count might show 3,000 wolves next time, because more wolves will successfully have puppies. Um, you know, if, if breeders were taken, the neighboring breeders get to move in and take over, just like they would if they did the killing. So, I mean, this is not as shocking as it's wow. made out to be. We are out of time. I can't believe it already. We're out of time. <laughs> Peggy Callahan, not McCallahan, Peggy Callahan is my guest, the Executive Director of the Wildlife Science Center. Go to their website if you'd like to help them. They could sure use some help financially. Thanks for watching. I'm Ray Gildow. See you next time.